Hi everyone and welcome to our summary about lipids and what we need to do before we delve too deeply into the land of the triglyceride is we need to understand some key facts about lipids in general. So the first thing to know then is that when we talk about lipids, this is a molecule that's got lots of atoms of carbon joined to hydrogens and smaller amounts of oxygen. So loads of carbon, loads of hydrogen, little bit of oxygen. These are non-polar substances, okay? So if they're non-polar, that means they're not going to dissolve in water. The reason for that is if it's a non-polar molecule, there's nothing to attract those polar water molecules. So remember, water being polar must then obviously dissolve polar substances, it doesn't dissolve the non-polars. They will, however, dissolve in alcohol. So that's a link to one of those biochemical tests that you need to know, obviously testing for the lipids. What we're going to do across this video and the next one, because we can have two in our lipid series, is have a look at these three most important lipids in our living organisms. So triglycerides is what we're focusing on in this particular video. And in the next video on lipids, we will look at the phospholipids and the steroids. What we're going to focus on for the rest of this video then are the triglycerides. So if we think, first of all, about the structure of a triglyceride, we need to know what they're made of. And it's really straightforward. There's two components to them, glycerol and fatty acids. When it comes to those fatty acids, there are many different fatty acids available to us. Some of these fatty acids we can make inside our bodies. Others we've got to take in as part of our diet because we can't make those ones. The ones that we've got to take in as part of our diet because we can't make them are referred to as essential fatty acids. If we consider the first part of our triglyceride First of all, we're going to look at the glycerol molecule. Now, if we look at the name, we can see it ends in OL. Going back to our GCSE chemistry, hopefully we are all sitting there thinking ends in OL. That means it's an alcohol. And it is. This is an example of an alcohol. That means its functional group is going to be the hydroxyl. So we've got these OH groups, three of them, in fact. So one, two, three of those OH groups. And we have three carbon atoms. Now you need to be able to draw this simple molecule. And it's dead easy to be able to do. All you need to do is remember three carbon atoms, put them in a little line for the backbone. Each carbon has the OH. And then hopefully we will remember carbon can make four bonds. So then if you just stick on the other lines and then just chuck a hydrogen on the end of it, any empty bond, that is our glycerol. Easy. Now, what we're going to be looking at is a triglyceride. But we need to understand what that name means before we really get into the nitty gritty about it. Anytime we see this word glyceride, this is an ester that we formed from glycerol joining to a fatty acid. So anytime you see that word glyceride, we have glycerol plus a fatty acid joined to it. So it's a type of ester. If we have a triglyceride, hopefully we know that tri just means three. So basically we've got three fatty acids joined to the single glycerol. So if they ask you a question about the structure of a triglyceride, make sure that you are explicit and say that there are three fatty acids joined to that glycerol molecule. And remember, they're all joined through this ester bond because they are esters. In terms of the fatty acids themselves that are going to be joining, then what we have is this hydrocarbon tail and our hydrocarbon tail is going to be this long chain of carbons and they're just going to have all these hydrogens attached to them. Now, obviously, drawing this out is going to take a while, particularly if it is a long chain. As a biologist, 
we like to take a shortcut where we can. So why would we draw out all of the carbons and the hydrogens like they do in chemistry when you know what? We can just do a zigzag. So this little bit here, this little zigzag part of the molecule, that is representing this bit here. That's exactly what we've drawn. So each of these little junctions are carbon atoms and then they've got all of those hydrogens joined onto them. We don't have to draw the carbons. The little zigzag does it for us. Now, the other thing to remember, because it is a fatty acid, that means we must have this functional group on the end, the carboxyl group. Remember carboxyl group, COOH. So we've got our carboxyl group, the carbon double bonded to an oxygen, and that bond to the oxygen and the hydrogen hydroxyl there. And then the rest of it is obviously our hydrocarbon tail. Altogether is a fatty acid. When we consider what these fatty acids could be, then there's a range and they will usually be between two and 20 carbon atoms long. Hence why I say you don't write out the whole thing. You can have our make at the end of 20, trust me. Now, what we do find is that when we've got this fatty acid, then our carboxyl group, the COOH, here it is, can become ionized. So if something is ionized, it becomes charged. So what we find is that can become ionized. So we'll form hydrogen ions and this negative ion, COO minus. Now, because those hydrogens are going to be released, then we have got these free hydrogen ions, which means it acts as an acid. So this is why we call it a fatty acid, because when it's ionized, it releases the hydrogen ions and therefore it increases the concentration of hydrogen ions in our solution, making it more acidic. If we think back to that specification reference at the beginning, we need to understand the difference between saturated and unsaturated. Hopefully something you did at GCSE, so shouldn't be anything new, I hope, but just in case, let's have a quick recap. When we talk about saturated, this is where we only have single bonds present. So if we've got a saturated fatty acid in that hydrocarbon part, it's all single bonds between the carbon atoms. If we've got an unsaturated fatty acid, we will have at least one double bond between two carbon atoms. So it might only be a single double bond, might have more than one double bond within the structure, but unsaturated means that there is at least one double bond which leads us nicely on some more naming that we can do and again we're following the same logical structure if we break it down we have got mono meaning one unsaturated tells us double bond so if we've got a mono unsaturated molecule it has one double bond present if we've got a poly unsaturated, poly means many, unsaturated still relating to those double bonds between the carbons. So poly unsaturated, more than one double bond present within the structure. What we find then is why we care about these double bonds being present. It's not just so that we can ask you about it on a biology exam paper. It's because it actually has an impact on the shape of the molecule. So when we've got a double bond present, rather than being this nice little straight chain, and just imagine that is a straight chain because clearly my drawing skills are not up to scratch tonight, then that would be our saturated. So in our saturated molecule, they're all in a lovely straight chain. If however, we have an unsaturated, so if we put a double bond in here, then we get a kink in our molecule, okay? So as soon as we go unsaturated, we get this little kink in the molecule here, and that means that we're going to have them pushing the other fatty acids away from each other. So if you imagine what we've looked at previously in terms of our triglyceride structure, there's our glycerol. If we've got one, two, three fatty acids all next to each other, and the one on this end has a little kink in it, then what it's going to do is it's going to push these other ones further away. So that makes it more fluid. 
what we find then is this then confers certain properties onto the different types of lipids that we encounter. So if we consider our animals, first of all, then animal fats contain quite a large number of saturated fatty acids. So if they're saturated, they're all straight chains, which means all of them sit quite closely together. That means we're going to have a solid at room temperature. If, however, we've got a larger number of unsaturated fatty acids, as we tend to find in a lot of plants, for example, then that means that we're going to have this little sort of kink, which is going to push them further away from each other, causing them to have a lower melting point, And therefore, these tend to be liquid at room temperature. Just think about some of your common sort of vegetable oils that you've got in the cupboard. That's because they're unsaturated fatty acids there. So how does this actually work? How do we make a triglyceride? Well, we are going to be joining fatty acids to glycerol. If we're joining things, we are talking a condensation reaction. Now, the condensation reaction is going to occur between the little COOH of the fatty acid and the OH here of our glycerol. So what we're going to see is these two parts of our molecules are going to react to form the all important named ester bond. So what does this ester bond look like? Well, if we just quickly redraw it down here, so we're going to draw the same backbone. There's our three carbon atoms. We're still just going to leave these other two as they were. And then we're just going to add the hydrogens just so that that bit of the molecule is all complete. So that's the bit that's unchanged. What we're going to do on this top carbon here is we're going to join this molecule here. So we're going to join that on. So what we actually do is you have your bond coming away from the carbon, connects to an oxygen, over to the carbon, and that's this carbon here, and therefore we've got to double bond that to the oxygen, just like we had previously, and then we've obviously got the rest of the hydrocarbon. So that then just shows us how we can draw this. When it comes to what the ester bond actually is, that is this bit here. So the carbon double bonded to the oxygen, single bonded to another oxygen. That bit there is called the ester bond. The process that occurs in order to form that ester bond is quite simply esterification. So what we're doing is a condensation reaction because we are joining obviously these two chemicals together. And because if we look at the difference in the structure, we've gone from OH and OH just down to an O. So we've also released water, hence condensation. The last part of our video for the triglycerides is to have a look at their functions. And there are five functions that we need to know as far as triglycerides go. First one is that they are an energy source. This is something that's going to come up again when you are doing the respiration work, which will probably be in your year 13 course. So energy source, our triglycerides are going to be broken down during respiration and used to generate ATP. Now, what we actually find is because we've got all of these little hydrogens, all of the oxygen, etc., then when we're respiring our lipids, we're going to produce more water than if we were respiring sugar. Okay, just by the sheer number of hydrogen atoms there are, they join to more of the oxygens and therefore more water is made. We should also remember the fact that if we look at the structure there of glycerol and fatty acids, All we have carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. Therefore, once those ester bonds are hydrolyzed, so obviously we're adding water back in to break those bonds, then we can break down the glycerol and the fatty acids process to be continued in year 13 work in order to just end up with carbon dioxide and water. Our second key function is as an energy store not to be mixed up with energy source. So energy source generates ATP. Energy stores are basically ways that we can keep this energy locked away within the cells without affecting the water potential. And the reason it doesn't affect the water potential of our cell is because it is insoluble in water. 
In terms of our mammals, then we store fat in these things called adipose cells just under the skin. And what we actually find is that this is a really useful store of energy, because if we compare gram for gram fat to glucose, so one gram of fat to one gram of glucose, we're able to get twice as much energy from that fat as we are from glucose. And that all comes down to that much higher proportion of those hydrogen atoms. And you'll find out why that is when we do respiration fully. Number three on our list of functions of our triglycerides is as insulation. Now, what we find is it acts as an insulator both in terms of heat, so a thermal insulator, because that adipose tissue can insulate against our heat loss. Think about things like blubber on whales, for example, that live in these very cold waters. But it also acts as an insulator for those electrical impulses that travel in our nerve cells. So what we find is that it is a good insulator, just be specific in your answers. So don't just write insulator, use obviously electrical insulator, thermal insulator, give the specific example if it asks you for one. Make sure you're not being vague in your answers. Specificity is key at A level. Our fourth function on the list is buoyancy. So basically what we find is this is why you don't sink. Now, if we're going back to the basics, fat is less dense than water. Think about when you've done washing up, and I hope you've all done some washing up to help out at home. Then if you're washing up a pan that's had some kind of oil in it, then it all floats on the surface of your washing up bowl. The reason for that is it's less dense than water, so it floats. Useful to our aquatic animals because that means it helps them stay afloat and stops them sinking to the bottom of whatever they're swimming in. Very useful. Also the reason that women tend to float better than men, because women tend to have a greater proportion of body fat than men, just based on their natural structures. Therefore, they float easier than men do. So the fifth and final function of our triglycerides is in the form of protection. We've got a range of organs in our body that are not actually protected by the skeleton. Now, these organs are still delicate. They're incredibly useful to, you know, life. Therefore, they need some form of protection. So what we have is this layer of fat, hopefully only a reasonable layer of fat around those delicate organs so that if there's a knock on that region of the body, then the fat acts as a shock absorber, protecting the delicate tissue underneath. And what we find is even bacterial cells have got in on this action because there are some bacterial cells that have got this lipid rich outer coat around that peptidoglycan cell wall they've got. And that's the difference between our gram positive and gram negative bacteria is that one has this lovely outer coating around it to help protect it. The other one does not. So hopefully you found this video useful. And if you want to review any of those bits, don't forget to look at the resources over on the A-Level website. Don't forget to subscribe so you can see when the next A-Level video is uploaded.